the hour. So I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. We're looking at five great ways to channel shift customers from phone to digital. Certainly seems to be a, a very popular topic in terms of the number of people registered and number of people already into the uh, into our chat room, which is great. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our two speakers for today. Uh, delighted to be joined again by Martin Hill Wilson from uh, Brain Food Consulting. Martin and I have done quite a large number of, uh, of webinars, uh, webinars together. So welcome back, Martin. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Looking forward to this one. And uh, I think it's, it's going to be a, a topic that's absolutely up your street. Yes, it is indeed. <laughs> I've got lots to say as you. Delighted to welcome to uh, his first webinar with Call Send Help, although I know, I understand you've done a couple of webinars with Martin Hill Wilson before. So welcome, uh, Saddam Iqbal from uh, West. Thank you very much. Again, looking forward to this. Yeah, it's a great topic. Wonderful. And uh, Saddam, you've been with uh, Magnetic North for quite a number of years before it was uh, acquired by West. Yeah. Uh, yeah but all, all in all, 13, just over 13 years. So uh, it's, been, it's been a great uh, experience it's just to see the technology mature over, over the years as well. So it's, uh, I think we're finally getting to a place where um, Omnichannel might actually live up to you know, all the hype from a few years ago. Wonderful. And Saddam, what's your job role within West? Uh, Senior Director of uh, uh, Information Technologies and responsible for the product development um, and uh, that uh, goes across the whole contact center suite. So uh, the actual contact center applications, call recording, PCI, uh, secure payment modules, uh, as well as UCAS solutions. So we've got a, quite an international team spread around the world um, of development teams and operational teams at West. Um, we, we, West has got a quite a large portfolio across uh, even more uh, technology spaces than just this as well. So we're, we're uniquely placed to be able to bring all of our technology assets together alongside our size and scale to be able to provide great technology for our customers. Wonderful. Well, um, if you want to see a recording of today's uh, webinar or want to uh, share the uh, slides after the webinar, uh, you can go to callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded webinars. I know a number of you do like to share the webinars with your uh, with your management team. Um, uh, we're carrying on the discussion in our chat room. That's at callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. Uh, here's the uh, address to uh, type it in. It does need to go into uh, uh, into a different uh, different browser. And uh, typically, you tend to have uh, two screens, one side by side with the uh, one side by side with the other. So it is in a separate. Uh, it is in a separate window. Uh, there is an added advantage for being in our chat room is that uh, you can uh, uh, ask questions or tips. We do have a, um, a prize for the best tip. It can either be uh, a bottle of uh, a bottle of champagne. We've got one here. If you prefer a box of chocolates, we can ship that off. Or if you prefer an Amazon gift card, so uh, the best uh, tip or the best question uh, we'll pick out at the end of the webinar. Um, so, uh, yeah, callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat is the address for that. And now, before we get going, I'd just like to understand what is the primary driver for your channel shift strategy? Is it to reduce service cost or is it to respond to customer expectations? So, is it all about uh, giving the uh, user choice of what they're looking for? Is that what customers expect you to do? Or is it because you, um, you need to uh, to reduce cost within your uh, within your business. I know that's certainly a focus of a lot of uh, local governments. So I'd just like to uh, vote on that. Martin, have you got any? Uh, uh, I, I have a very strong view on it, but I'm going to hold my counsel until I actually see the results. So it's not to prejudice, but I, I, I think it's going to be 75-25 in a particular direction. That okay. Well, let's. Let's have a look and see where the uh, results come through. We've got a sample size of 94, not too far off 75, 25. It's more two thirds, one third. Um, a third are looking to reduce costs roughly and two thirds to respond to customer expectations. Right. Well, I'm going to eat my hat then. It was the other way around. I was expecting. That's very good. Ah, That's excellent. Excellent. I think news. that's a change so, actually, then, in terms of what people have been motivated to do. That's cool. Okay. That's yeah, good. I think it's uh, it's very good. I think you know the market is changing quite uh, 
uh, quite dramatically. So if anyone's got any um, uh, reasons uh, 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 that you'd like to put into our chat room, uh, it's a good time to uh, put those in of why your organization is having a channel shift strategy. So just to uh, close that down, and Martin's probably now a good t a chance to take through some of the uh, your ideas of um, uh, great ways to channel shift customers from phone to digital. So Indeed. Across to you, Martin. Great, thank you very much. So let me just get my screen up and running. And we should be there in a second. Right. There we are. So, good stuff. Um, so I've got a couple, we, we promised five, didn't we? Five good, great ways of doing it. Um, I've got a couple uh, of extras, so they're, they're coming in as zeros. They're just bonus points, really, for, for your prize of five. Um, first couple of points really sort of are part of a common theme, which is that if you are going to be doing channel strategy, then obviously that, that needs to fit in with an overall plan. Um, and also, ideally, that fits into a mindset which looks through the opportunity through the eyes of the customer. So outside in design is, is, is particularly important. And to that extent, by the way, it's encouraging to see that two thirds are motivated from that uh, uh, point of view, as opposed to purely an internal cost reduction. So changing channels really fits within a, an omni-channel design and strategy. And this is the way that a number of you will see me describe it before. Fundamentally, you've got voice, text, and video. You can deliver that either through live assistance, assisted service, you can deliver that self-serve or proactive service. And indeed, the customer these days have got a bit choice uh, around of that. And the thing that drives the way in which you want to organize, particularly the, the choice points, is, is around of the nature of the task. And I think that was reflected in people's response to which channel do they like to use earlier on. So assisted remains very much the domain of humans when it's emotional, complex, and matters to the relationship. Uh, Self-serve is increasingly taking over where it's possible to deliver education, information and task completion 24-7. Uh, and again, the tech and our ability to design that continues to improve year on year. And I suppose particularly because of the arrival of machine learning and the ability to spot patterns and therefore be proactive and predictive, we should be able to anticipate customer needs much more than we have traditionally been able to do. And so proportionately speaking, that should become a larger contribution um, in terms of our overall mix. What does that look like over time? Well, it's not an overnight activity. Um, moving from assisted service, whether that is text or voice, where it's about three quarters of the whole of your mix, will eventually mature into something different. On the right-hand side of the page, probably about 25% of that, all things being equal. And the example I've given you here is from Microsoft. Um, and I saw Andrew present, top of this year in fact, talking about his strategy. And you can see in his support volume trends that he is managing to transform the amount of live assistance in favor of what they've called here virtual support. Uh, and as a result of that, his costs are not going up, but he's also still being able to uh, match requirements. Uh, for what it's worth, it seems to me that you can ship off probably about 10% maybe 20 if you really rock it every year. So it's about a five year journey for most people going through that particular transformation. Thing that sits underneath of that, of course, is, is the human response to seeing change. And of course, we don't like change, um, particularly if it disrupts what we're perfectly comfortable with. Uh, and perfectly laid plans are always subverted by humans who are hardwired to expend the least effort and will find the least effort in terms of getting what they want. So if people are determined to get a live human being somehow, they will find the equivalent of the zero on the phone, they will find a way around through the IVR, they will look for your telephone number, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so in terms of you taking a point of view around of channel shift, it's always best to do it through the eyes uh, and the considerations and priorities of the customer, because then you've got to be aligned with their behaviors, which you can't so easily control, um, and then you can make sure that there's going to be strong adoption at the end of the day. It's not to say you can't nudge people, by the way, there's a lot of good stuff in behavioral economics that, that absolutely shows that you can encourage people to adopt, but fundamentally, you have got to, which is my second point, attract them through making it a better experience. So in other words, this is why it's so important that it sits uh, through the lens of the customer. What are we doing to transform and make it better? 
And I think there's probably a couple of generic uh, opportunities that sit here. The first one is that it's certainly true that when you get a customer into a digital domain, then the activities and behaviors of that customer are easily traceable. Um, you know, digital marketing has known this for a long time. We're increasingly seeing this in a service context. We can see the behavior of customers online. We can start to identify them. We can match them in real time against profile of information that we've got. And as a result of that, we can personalize much earlier on. So that's a real benefit, particularly it's weighted, generally speaking, in, in a digital way towards younger cohorts. But personalization is a core expectation, and that's a tick in the box. The other thing that is probably true of all generations is please make it easier. And uh, effort still remains the single largest trigger on getting an improvement on, on scores such as NPS. Um, and it's still true that the vast majority of customer journeys that flow through service centers are more complex than they need to be. There's lots of good reasons for that, but if you ask customers what they want, then the reduction of effort absolutely stands there. So if we are going to channel shift, try to make sure that the introduction of a new way of engaging also is designed into an improved uh, overall experience. In other words, the journey has been improved rather than the fact we're just swapping from voice to text uh, at the end of the day. And then to the point on the left-hand side of that slide, the take-up should therefore be powerful. So you're not just irritating for the sake of changing, you're actually improving the overall experience. So, uh, oh, actually, here's a good example. Um, onboard experiencing. This is for a mobile uh, provider. This is all about you want to get somebody into a secure environment to be able to do, oh, I don't know, task completion like loans or financing or something of that nature. So you need to know who the person is and the authentication can be a real chore. In this particular example, it's, it's made pretty quick, pretty simple, pretty painless. Uh, on the left-hand side, is an example of a visual ID, uh, something official, such as a driving license, could be a passport. Um, the system then verifies that that piece of uh, identity, identification is for real, it's not a facsimile, and then it starts to zoom in on the actual picture of the customer, and then the next part of that process will be to use the camera within the smartphone to compare and contrast the actual picture of the customer against that one, and make a judgment to, to uh, call in terms of risk. Um, and then finally authenticate the customer from that. On the other side of the page, again, you've got a relatively simple way uh, of using voice biometrics as it happens, uh, as a way to be able to authenticate the customer as well. So here's an example of introducing new ways of engaging, but within the overall remit of improving uh, the overall experience for the customer. And the other thing, by the way, that absolutely matters, probably as much as the, anything else that I've said so far, is consistency. Uh, and if we are introducing more channels, we are probably introducing greater diversity of choice, in which case we are then having to confront the issue of consistency. And I am aware of research that says that if I ask you a simple question through voice, SMS, email, web cell service, there's a very, very high likelihood still that I'm going to receive fundamentally different answers. Um, and one of the things that we're undoubtedly building at the moment is the interplay between virtual assistance, which provides a sort of a self-service front end, to then a human picking up the conversation. Uh, in this particular instance, we're talking about it might be SMS, uh, might be chat, it might be messaging. But the point being is, as we move between those two ways of delivering service, the context of the conversation, what we know about the customer's intent, has to flow as well and has to be consistent. And by the way, you can also put in service knowledge uh, as part of that need for consistency. So these are, if you want, some of the broader issues that sit in successfully deploying and doing channel shift. That's my first uh, point, really. So now on to the first of five. Um, I've called this one a hole-in-one, my golfing analogy. Um, and it's to do with a very, very simple thing, but something that's often missed, uh, unless you're actually doing journey mapping and you realize that if you look behaviorally uh, where people begin their journeys. Of course, they don't begin on your website. They don't even begin by phoning your contact center. Uh, they actually begin by going to a search box. This is universal behavior. Um, and the vast majority of customers will start by trying to search for a solution. Now, that's a big, big clue because if you think about that, the ideal scenario, therefore, is that whatever I key into that search box, and we all know, by the way, that the way that we communicate in search boxes is pretty illiterate, 
It also applies, by the way, on ver uh, voice searches as well. Um, we, we need to somehow link the fact that I the customer has said something and you have got an asset sitting in a service portal on your website which answers that particular question. And the thing that brings those two will, oh, sorry, here's an example of a travel planning from a customer. I've noticed on this particular analysis that, for example, there are 34 searches that take place across that decision-making process. So again, the habit of using search to find relevant material absolutely embedded into all of us. Now, the trouble is that, um, you know, we don't necessarily do a good job um, for customers when they do try to actually come in and see what's going on because a lot of them are forced to call, very frustrated as a result of that because they can't find what they're looking for, even though that material may well exist somewhere. So this is my point. If customers are going to start in the search routine, what are you doing to make sure that the answer that you've got comes right the way up to the top of the page? And simply put, that's SEO. So search engine optimization is the business of making sure that where you've tagged uh, your content is recognized and causes a direct link. Um, again, the knowledge of SEO is very strong in digital marketing. I wonder how strong that is uh, in some service organizations but it's a fantastic opportunity to make sure you get good returns from all of that great work that you've been doing in terms of creating answers, putting them into FAQs uh, online. So that's my first point. So, Holy so one, if the customer can get that answer, you've minimized everything thereafter. Sorry. So sorry. Martin, is the, is, the, is the real uh, trick here if you're going to improve the search box, is it actually getting a better search engine on your website or is it actually really about looking at what people are searching for and designing answers going so uh, increasing the number of people like frequently asked questions okay um two 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 points I'm, I'm making the the research i was looking at here is saying that people are going to start to use public domain um search uh, services like google in the first instance so google would do its thing you've made a very good point there though that, and that is that when you go onto a website and try to use its <laughs> search capability it is altogether inferior to the experience that they get from Google. So yes, if you find that you have got a lot of material and you're driving people to do work, you know, to do self-serve on the website, you might want to be upgrading that search capability to function as well and as cleverly as the Google version of life. I think it's a very good point because it's very disappointing otherwise if you get that. So hole in one, that's one of the things that you should be looking for. The next thing, if I had to prioritize in terms of how do I get people out of the habit of, 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 of phoning me and exposing them to the, all the great digital assets, particularly self-service that I've been creating, I have to say I think visual IVR is a very powerful contender. Um, I, th I think IVR has got a bad press, some of it justified, but mainly it's not so much the tech, it's the poor design that goes with that tech. Uh, that gets people very frustrated, as a result of which we hate IVR. It's got that reputation, whether justified or not. And what I find interesting about visual IVR when I first came across it is that you're really flipping people from an auditory-based experience into a visual-based experience. And again, as with omni-channel, there's no such thing as a killer sense. It just happens to be what's most appropriate. But it's interesting that when we're trying to remember options, Many of us find it easier to see those options than necessarily hear those options. Secondly, I would say that when you can see those options, particularly on a smartphone where you can also tap and scroll, it's much more intuitive and much faster for the customer to actually pick that option rapidly. And as a result of that, you break out of one of the great constraints of IVR, which is that you can only have classically five wide, three deep in terms of the structure of the menu, you can have a much more sophisticated set of choices because the customer does not feel overwhelmed. They can easily navigate up and down that particular stack and they can choose the particular um, services that they want. And for those of you who have not yet come across this technology, <clears throat> it's interesting because A, you can lift your existing audio IVR straight into this format, but you can basically create a very powerful workflow. First of all, specifying your service. And secondly, you can then um, actually offer uh, a number of ways in which they can engage. Now, those can be live. They could be, for example, talking or chatting. 
or messaging. Um, it could be that it's a self-service routine. Um, it could be that you put some dynamic messaging in the middle of that stuff as well. So that's a place where you can direct traffic, particularly at peak periods of time. And then, by the way, in the last example here, uh, if you so choose, you can then schedule a callback if, if everything looks uh, you know, just a little bit too complicated at the end of the day. And what you've managed to do by doing that, of course, is to take people out of a phone-based queue across into digital assets such as your online site uh, or into a digital channel such as messaging, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a very powerful thing to do. Now, Saddam, I know that you've, you, you're keen on visual IVR and you've been doing some interesting work on that. So anything you'd like to add? And absolutely. Um, I think one of the key things are, um, especially when you've got natural language IVRs, um, they've got a bit of a bad rep. Um, you know, you, you say um, yes or no to an answer, you say no. You say, did you say yes? I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. So with uh, visual IVRs, you can not only make them more interactive and more meaningful as to what, why the person is calling, but you can capture richer information. So, you know, you can capture postcodes, zip codes, whatever, and, and kind of not like rely on DTMF. Uh, input etc so you've got a lot more control over there on top of that you can also build in IDMV uh, into a visual IVR at that point so the caller doesn't have to then identify themselves again so you can screen all that information out and then when you get through to the agent the agent can say hi you know, Mr Hill Wilson you know I see you want to call, talk to us about your, your, your new claim for your car the yeah. conversation is a hell of a lot simpler and easier. Um, and, you know, some of the stuff that we've done, um, you, you kind of go through the IVR and then you get to a point where you want to talk to somebody, but um, the, the, the app will then actually call the number and put a pin code through for you so that you don't have to do anything. So if you're driving or commuting, uh, it just simplifies the experience. Uh, and and the, the, the feedback that we get on and, and customers is, is they love it, especially compared to other forms of communication. Yeah, it's really got a wow factor to the whole thing. It obviously focuses on customers using smartphones, just to make the point. Um, and yeah. the system will dynamically recognize a smartphone number and therefore proactively offer that service to the customer and they can flip uh, into using it in that particular way. Um, but I think it's a foundation capability. You know, If you haven't seen it before, go and have a look at it. I think it's a, it's a really elegant uh, and effective way of, of, of moving people across from voice into other uh, other choices. Okay, so that's that. Mobile apps. Um, I've, I've caveat mobile apps with the, with the statement, of course, that uh, getting the habit of using your app is not the simplest thing in life. Um, and indeed, there's been a lot of arguments that we're all a bit apt out, and that's why we like messaging and all the rest of the stuff in life. So I think you need to decide on the basis of the fact that you have something that the customer is likely to use on a frequent basis so the habit is established and therefore it's effective um, it does by the way also reflect something that you should know and i know that asking customers they often don't know this question but how many of your inbound calls are made by customers who are using a smartphone and that's a key piece of research that you ought to know because uh, of course if they're using that then the question is is a uh, a mobile app appropriate and just to give you one good example about the the use of channel shift in that context of a mobile app comes from um, a fintech uh, in, here in the UK called Atom Bank, uh, very strong on customer experience. Uh, and you, uh, if you can't quite see, I'll read it you out. But the first screen says, you know, here you are in a queue waiting for chat support. That's what you asked for. Uh, the system has proactively identified there's a 10 minute wait, in which case there's a trigger that says, by the way, um, would you like to have help from a virtual assistant uh, because obviously you might not want to wait that long uh, the customer in this example starts off by saying yes and then that triggers uh, and moves into that particular thing there so again that's all contained uh, within the the mobile app now the reason for making that point is to say that you might want to go and check out if you do have mobile apps that customers use whether or not they have got built-in service capability. Many original first-generation apps were built by marketeers who had particular points of focus for that. Didn't necessarily occur to them that they would want to be able to connect customers to yourselves in the service team. And yet the stats say, you know, 20% of customers actually are looking for help in app and don't want simply to say, please phone the following number, please email us. That's very unintuitive and breaks the whole experience. So again, Matt, uh, apps, if you do them, make sure that you've got the habit there, make sure you're servicing the customer uh, and, and make it effective. If all those things are fulfilled, that can be a hugely successful thing. 
Right, so we've given a couple of examples. I think it's time, John T, to ask the audience for their wisdom. We've given enough at the moment. Well, we've got quite a lot of uh, feedback in from the audience. The uh, chat room has been uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely humming. Let's have a look at some of the uh, opinions that have come through. Uh, Adekemi has said, channel shifting is somewhat easy, but the key issue arises when you move your customers to self-service uh, online and the user experience on your website is rigid. I don't, uh, I'd always any company to ensure the channel you're shifting your customers to is adequate. Mm. fit for purpose and efficient before shifting. This way you have less resistance. Uh, quite an interesting comment there. Uh, Neil, uh, in response to your comment on search, yes. said uh, research is about producing content to serve the intent of the searcher. You can infer intent of the, comp uh, of the content by the search terms. Yes. What that's highlighting there is that with um, techniques such as Google Analytics, um, you can actually see the search terms that are, that people are looking through. Uh, and Saddam, presumably you've got a little bit of experience on this. And then based on that, you can then uh, tailor your content for what sorts of things people are looking for. Absolutely, you need to be looking at what people in the in your industry are searching for, as in you can get that data from uh, the likes of the search engine providers and then target the uh, the content that you're building. You've got to be building content all the time. You've got to be putting out on social media and other things and kind of linking back to your website just so you kind of get up the rankings. Obviously, different search engines, uh, uh, algorithms are different. So um, you've got to kind of find a search engine optimization partner that can help you because it is something that is a bit of a dark art and, and you probably will need uh, some assistance with. And you can probably see that from the search box on your own website. I guess you can get that from transcriptions of phone calls and live chats and so on. So lots of uh, yes. uh, ideas that give you intent there. Tony says, recognize when your customer is having difficulty with the, with the digital channel and be ready to intervene to offer support or follow up if they uh, if they disconnect. I think it's a good uh, good one there. Uh, and similar, I guess, uh, similarly here, uh, Ben says, ensure that the customer is in control and they're able to communicate how and when they want to. Automation and self-service are very useful tools and should be an option, but this is not satisfying to everyone. And uh, the customer should have the power to make their own decision. If they'd like to speak to a human being or call somebody, make sure all options are available with consistency across channels and minimal effort for the for the customer. Is there a danger with the move to digital, Martin, that people get, you know, we've got the chatbot, we've got the FAQs, that's that's sufficient? Well, I mean, I'm encouraged by the audience claiming that
actually help. And by the way, whilst I'm on the soapbox, voice is digital as defined by it being the issue faster, especially when files, for instance, screenshots have to be exchanged. And I think that's uh, that's quite a nice one there, because you know, what are you seeing on your screen? Have you got a photo? Have you got a, a picture? And particularly as we move to smartphones, it becomes a lot easier to uh, a lot easier to uh, uh, easier to do that. Uh, Ashley, I think Ashley's trying to win a prize here. Ashley said, "I feel communication is the key when going through digital transformation. Communication to employees, third parties, as well as to your customer base. I think is uh, uh, a good one." Soleil said, uh, "Be consistent across all the channels and cohesive, so the customer does not have to repeat themselves." Let's take one more here. Uh, Ashley, oh, Ashley again, uh, offer options to the customer versus forcing them to go to uh, a chatbot or an automated route when they prefer not to do so. If you force them to complete, uh, to use complete automation without an option, you may end up losing them as customers altogether. And I think that's right. certainly a, a risk that uh, some of the uh, more automated things I've seen in the, uh, in, in the, in the USA could be, uh, could be pushing people towards. So Martin, that's the, that section. Uh, well, I, I would say just reflecting on the collective wisdom there that there's a common theme, which is know your situations, know your journeys in detail, um, and make your choices based upon understanding them. I think that's 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 some really good stuff from people. So, still on the theme. Uh, the next one is is channel choice, um, and choice of channel in my observation is, is, is based on situation, but certainly upon generation. Um, there are some that dislike voice uh, to be purely neutral. You know, there are people who find it fantastic, but there are other people that really just experience it as an inconvenience because it's based upon what you, the caller, want, rather than the fact that I would like to have a communication style where I can just get it done in my own time and my own pace. You know, convenience uh, is the key thing. That's one of the core arguments around of messaging, obviously. It's an asynchronous communication as opposed to chat, which tends to finish at the end of the session. Um, UK data, probably you can see this reflected um, wherever you are uh, on the planet, but there is a very clear inverse relationship between age and also preference for email versus preference for social and messaging um, at the end of the day. So again, what are you going to do there? And back to the point about trying to get rid of email too quickly, if you have a slightly older cohort, you've probably got a problem there because people are familiar with it and therefore stick with what they are most familiar with. Uh, younger cohorts, you know, again, it's no big deal this, we know this, but it's interesting. Uh, chat, again, is led by generation. And then on the right-hand side of the page, you might want to open up to this idea, which is that um, certainly if you look at our messaging habit, um, it's not just a text medium, obviously, it's a very versatile medium and video certainly has grown exponentially in terms of our use you know the bandwidth's there the compression is there we're just very familiar with it the stat here says a quarter of a quarter of millennials use it on an everyday basis now that's not to say you should necessarily introduce it just because they are using it but if there are use cases for video and i'm going to come up with a couple in a minute then you've certainly got a receptive audience as far as that's concerned so moving on uh, into self-service matching engagement preferences. Um, probably the big news, as we all know, has been the growth of conversational AI, whether or not looking at the, um, as you're looking at it, left-hand page, the more traditional kind of, you know, little simple search boxes, which are text-based, uh, going to the very right hand of the page, the rapid rise in voice-based uh, self-service. Uh, and then in the middle, you've got the kind of combination of messaging with bots on top, uh, and then the imagery that you've got of the, of, of, of the people, you know, the digital humans, again, that is the exception to the rule at the moment, but uh, those are also coming into the frame in terms of being able to deliver service to customers. So a very versatile environment. Back to a point though, which is fundamental to this whole debate. 
in addition to deciding is it voice is it chat it's probably much more important to decide should it be live or should it be self-service and this was an example of somebody presented um Oh, about three, four years ago at a self at a bot conference I, I was attending. Ticket Biz is a Spanish-based business and they buy and sell, they, they offer a platform for buying and selling tickets that you, you can't use. Um, and they get lots and lots of questions about why the different price points for the tickets and stuff, which used to flow through to the contact center, took up a lot of the inbound voice, then they discovered they didn't really need to use that, so they flipped over to chat to do it, and then discovered actually it wasn't necessary to use humans at all. Uh, and the 80% number that you're seeing on the screen there reflected the fact that when they finally made that available as a self-service routine, the need and the appetite for chat completely dropped off a cliff. So again, if you are channel shifting, think first and foremost the split between live and self-service rather than necessarily getting overexcited about moving from voice to chat. We've also um, got, Martin, Martin, you asked uh, about the definition of digital. We've got a couple of uh, definitions. Please, that please do, whilst we're there. Yeah. If you'd like to. Uh, well, let me just put, these, uh, just put these up on my, uh, on yeah. my screen. They, uh, they're not universal, but quite an interesting one from Scott, who said that for our purposes, a digital transaction is an entire process. Yes. It can be completed without a human middleman. The only human involvement being the residents, I guess this is a local government, yeah. uh, a resident reporting or requesting the service, and where required, the human completing the requested service. Anything that involves someone to do something or another process can be triggered uh, uh, isn't a digital transaction in our book. So I guess that's, a, that's an interesting definition there, which I guess is, is possibly, I might call that self-service, well, then, I would call uh, it self-service, but it's got integrity to the definition. I like that. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. And uh, we've got a second definition that's come in from Richard, which I think is the McKinsey uh, insights at the bottom here, what, what digital really means. And according to Mc McKinsey, it's, a, it's tempting to look for s simple definitions, but to be meaningful and sustainable, we believe that digital should be seen less as a thing and a, more as a way of doing things help this definition more concrete we've broken it down to three attributes creating value at the new frontiers of the business world creating value in the processes that execute a, a vision of customer experiences and building a foundational capabilities that support the entire structure so quite that's a lot of work done that's a McKinsey not, pretty good yeah i understand that not entirely yeah. sure i'm much the wiser at the end of that but uh, i guess there's there's another level behind that so uh, so some interesting, uh, interesting definitions yeah. there. So if anyone else has another one, please keep them. Uh, yeah, keep going. That's useful. Through. Thank you very much. Um, right. Shall I uh, share your screen? Yeah. Yeah. Is my screen still there? Uh, oh, hopefully you should right. get it go. soon. There we go. Yeah. There we go. So back into the self-service thing. I think again, you know, this is an example actually from shop directors. It happens. Um, what I've noticed in terms of the evolution this year particularly is the integration of the, you know, the UI into legacy systems is getting much more powerful. So here's a good example about tracking returns uh, and indeed being able to complete a, a, a full journey. And back to the original definition, digital is where you can do the whole damn thing without involving somebody. I suppose by that definition, that would be digital. Um, so there's a, there's a powerful example there. To also make the point that it's not just a text uh, form of self-service in today's world, um, this is a recent piece of research looking at those smart speakers that some of us love um, and saying, hey, are you up for using that as a way of engaging in a brand's customer service capability? Um, and certainly from a US perspective, there's a third of um, customers that said, yep, we are up for that. So, you know, it's, it's an area that we thought maybe wouldn't be happening soon. And my slightly wry comment at the top there is it's the return of voice, albeit an automated version of it. Um, and that actually is out there as we speak. Um, and this is a hugely impressive example coming out of Germany, in fact, of an insurance company, which I, mu I have to say is a modern built one. I, it's, it's, I think it's built entirely upon uh, uh, cloud-based capability. But nonetheless, the customer can now not only receive advice from Alexa, but can also simultaneously conclude an insurance with only a few seconds. We started with foreign travel, 
and we're going to continue the whole damn kit and caboodle. So within that is the ability to ID and V someone to transact and complete a purchase entirely uh, through voice-based self-service. So if you wanted a new twist on the way that a voice-based IVR can function, there's your example moving through. Um, and here's another one, which is having covered text, having covered voice, let me now also cover video. And this is an interesting example of computer vision, uh, which is one of the AI capabilities. Um, and in this particular instance, you download an app. Um, you also, in this instance, are using a bot to guide you through. That bot can be escalated to a live assistance. But what you, the customer, are attempting to do is to install something. You're not an expert, so you want live assistance. Um, and what happens is that you use the, your own camera, which can then be filtered through the algorithm of a computer vision capability, which will go, do you know what? There's the box. That's the product. That's the particular type. As it happens, Arlo Pro is a, um, uh, what is it? I think it's a security cam system. Um, it can then overlay a, an AR layer on top of that, which means within the box, it can then point out to you what it's seeing. Because it's already got a record of that particular uh, product type. And it can then basically guide you through using the same capability uh, of uh, plugging it in, getting it working, pairing the system, and then finally making it work for you. And that is something which is, again, exciting in terms of uh, anybody that has got to support end users around of stuff, particularly electronic stuff, where talking or even type typing is laborious because it's much more intuitive to see it. But then to be able to control it in that particular way uh, through a combination of computer vision and AR, really smart. Uh, and again, if you've got the use case for that, that's a superb example, certainly in my book anyway. So that brings us to the end of the five examples. Uh, and we've got one last poll just to kick us off to a final set of conversations. Over to you, John T. Okay, and the uh, poll is to what degree have you reduced inbound uh, voice through channel shift? Uh, have you, is it none? Is it uh, one to ten percent? Eleven to twenty percent? Twenty-one to thirty percent? Or is it more than thirty percent? So have you been able to reduce inbound voice through channel shift? Um, so I'd be interested to see what the uh, what the answers on here. Uh, let's just close the poll and uh, we'll share the. Uh, if anybody is more than 31, I'd love to hear the actual number if you want to pop that into the chat window. Okay, let's uh, close this and we will share the results. Sample size here of 117. Uh, right. So it looks like 5% uh, have not managed to do any uh, channel shift. The biggest right. number is between 1% and 10%. Yeah. 25% uh, of, uh, of the audience. About a third of the audience have managed to get between uh, 10 and 20%. And it uh, looks like about 16% of the audience have got over 20% uh, mm. uh, reduction in inbound voice through channel shifts. Some quite, yeah. um, quite encouraging numbers there, Martin. Yes, uh, I, I think that's, that reflects good, good progress. And as I said, I'd love to hear from that 5%, you know, what numbers you've actually hit. Um, I'd also like to ask the question, particularly those who are in the, um, the 1% to 10%, actually any of you, has that gone as well as? or less well as you had hoped in terms of your targets? In other words, has it been more difficult to shift customers or have you found that they have leapt at it because you've actually fulfilled a requirement that you weren't previously doing? Um, anything anecdotal that we can add to that, that would be really interesting to know whether or not those are early results and going as planned or we're not quite as far advanced as we wanted to because of X, Y, Z. Indeed. Well, we've also talked through a lot of uh, technology, a number of different options, nat natural language IVR, visual IVR, messaging, and chatbot. So if you would want to uh, see a demonstration of uh, any of those facilities, uh, let's just get a um, uh, get this up on the screen. So um, uh, Saddam, I know you, you've talked it through a number of these, uh, uh, natural language yeah. IVR, messaging, Chatbot. So, if you'd like to see a demonstration of any of these facilities, we'd just like to uh, drop that into the box, and I'm sure that Saddam would be uh, happy to arrange that, or even a consultation uh, consultation yeah. with anyone. So, uh, 
that's just that yeah it doesn't have that. to be a demo if, if folks are just looking for uh, a chat about uh, how they could uh, utilize some of these technologies that we can share some of the technology we've got as well as uh, stories and use cases of, of how people use those wonderful well let's have a look at uh, what's been happening in the chat room it's been absolutely uh, uh, humming uh, along um, so uh, let's have a look at some of the feedback uh, Felicia says know your customer base companies will build what we think customers want rather than building support channels based on on what they want uh, Martin this has me in me in mind of your slide where you have the uh, the, the, the footpath uh, through a yeah. park and the actual uh, beaten track in the grass that people yeah have, uh, I love that comment I think that's absolutely on the money tick in the box absolutely yeah. when, definitely when I think um, that, that one's really key and it comes back down to the fact that um, you know, I try to break it down into small bite sized chunks and not go to waterfall uh, trying to design the whole thing out at once. I know you can do uh, journey mappings and, and things like that but uh, the key is uh, make a change and see what impact it's having and kind of uh, learn from that to make more additional changes. And one yeah. of the, the fabulous things with the contact center we've got so much information you can listen to calls you can see transcripts of, uh, of web chats you know there's just a, a lot you can survey yeah. customers there's a lot of information about uh, uh, whether things are, are working or not uh, in um, in terms of channel shift Andrea says we've managed up to 90 percent channel shift uh, in some countries is that uh, okay you've provoked me now is that self-serve or is that still live but through a different kind of modality love to hear the answer to that Andreas very impressive though very impressive so Andreas, yeah, if you'd like to uh, pop uh, answer that in the in the chat box would be good. Um, Nadia says, I question if this should be called channel shift. It feels yeah. like what we're all trying to do is provide a customer experience that matches customer expectation. It's about customers having the right channel to to do the job. I think that's a, an interesting one about um, is it channel shift or is it self-service, I guess, is the... Um... Well, it comes to the first point, which is that if most people were still saying it's a cost reduction exercise for the internal agenda, then you are shifting it, you know, and they have to put up with it, is the, is the unsaid point. But Nadia is making absolutely the right point that we don't really want to be building that for customers, you know, both for the psychology of adoption and also for customer, uh, customer experience. So maybe the language is just, you know, it's just wrong. It's about providing diversity, really, um, and, and delivering on that. Yeah, and it's a, 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 I think some of it is about customer's choice, and maybe some there's an element of educating people about what's the best channel to use yeah. for that particular problem. I know at Amazon, for instance, say, if you've got a problem, what, roughly what it's about, and then they say, it's a phone call or it's a web chat, or you know, have, a look at this, uh, have a look at this page here. Um, Ryan says email gives an assurance that the message is read also serves as a proof that I did raise a complaint and it was not answered I, I particularly like email email for me is I can actually pop the problem and send it off it doesn't always necessarily need to go through uh, verification um, and also the fact it's you know it's quite time efficient if it's you know just want to raise something you can uh, you can just send it through without needing um, uh, a long uh, conversation about it. Um, Andrea says it's the figure to submit the support request directly into our ticket system with the option to find the answer directly from the knowledge base is the 90%. Okay, right, right, that makes good sense. Reduction, yeah. so yeah. I think uh, ties in well. Thank you for that. And um, interesting one here, Saddam, young users or children having their first foray into banking uh, seem to be uncomfortable using the video conferencing that some banks or building societies now use for in-branch account opening. I wonder whether the desire from millennials using video will continue to continue to trend. I guess this is a an example of, yeah. of banks wanting to close branches yeah. and millennials perhaps being more happy with the, if you like, taking a photo of their of their um, details rather than wanting a sort of like an interview yeah uh, absolutely i think um it, it's a good point uh, people sometimes and, and i've seen it uh, in different countries people behave differently but sometimes there is a, a slight kind of uh, nervousness to get on video with somebody but once you've done it once you kind of start building relationships and especially in banking it's, it's quite important to build relationships uh, um so you've got that aspect to it and we'll see it more in healthcare uh, where 
you know, uh, the, the health services are starting to, to do video uh, consultations, which which is perfect, right? So if you're out and about and you can't get to the doctors and, and the different things, I think video trend will definitely continue and we'll see a lot more of it. Martin, do you think this is an example of, of not giving channel choice? This is done for a perceived benefit rather than an actual benefit? Well, I, I, it's an interesting comment and, and generally, having read quite a lot of social media commentary about the closure of branches and my you know my granny is 25 miles away from the local branch and she can't get on the local bus blah 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 and you've taken away my bank manager relationship i have always been in favor of a video supplement you know as being the next best thing as, as far as that's concerned but the comment here i don't know what the source of this is is interesting um and and it might just be that younger children, um, I don't know what age we're talking about here, just don't have the, the same social clues about how you relate to an adult. They're more familiar with doing it in a face-to-face -face context, but it might just be more intimidating. And if that is the case, I wouldn't necessarily say that the channel is inappropriate, but I do think the people who are using it probably need to spend more time on the initial connection uh, and, the, and the establishment of trust in that first period of time uh, and, and making for sure the child feels in control of that experience and not intimidated. It might be subtle things about where the camera is positioned, you know, hierarchically or not, or little things as far as that's concerned. So, um, but it's interesting feedback. I hadn't heard that before. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, my son is uh, just graduating this year and was asking about, you know, he's got a Santander account. They've closed the branch, the local branch, mm -hmm. and was asking about, um, you know, moving accounts and it's like you know if there is no local branch there's no particular need for a, a traditional bank anymore and i think that's where some of the challenger banks are going to go, going to come through um, well i've heard it said on people sitting on stage you know that my daughter often is that that kind of conversation my son yeah. uh, of that generation where their relationship with the bank is through an app they've already killed two 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 challenger banks and they're on to their third already yeah. i haven't even yeah. left my, yet at my age <laughs> It's a new world, and that is very frightening for the traditional big four. Um, but if you've got this kind of behavior that a bank is as disposable as a fashion retail brand, you know, that's in a whole new world. Indeed. Andrew says, my tip is to explore options of integrating simple digital channels into your IVR. Things like outbound SMSs to self-service portals, in-queue messages advertising your new live chat function, etc. Then move on uh, to moving queuing voice callers into live chat agents to make most of your uh, of your op teams. Um, the danger here is that I guess Martin, people have already come from your website. Sorry, can you only... put it on the screen, John T? Sorry, it didn't flip across for uh, me anyway. Oh, sorry, here it's coming through. Um, oh, yeah. My tip is to explore options of integrating simple digital channels into your IVR. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the, the the challenge here is if people are in the IVR, then they've almost come from your survey, 78% are on the website already. They've already been looked, they've already tried the digital, if you like, and they're, they're flipping to voice because uh, in the vast majority, uh, the digital isn't working. Well, I, general point, and it might be unfair to infer that, but the general point is you have to have a really granular feedback and understanding of what's happening around the behaviors. And if people are just going around in loops, clearly they're going to be very frustrated and fed up with it. Um, so, you know, just swapping one for t'other isn't going to take people anywhere. The, the, the point is whether or not you're, the options you're creating with people is, is getting them through the system faster and getting them to the outcomes that they like. To support the point that's been made here, I think, yes, there are plenty of low tech, low cost ways of knitting these little pathways together to make it easier for customers to do things. And I think sometimes people forget, you know, you can actually connect these things in that particular way. You're quite big on that, Saddam, aren't you? You can do some really quite funky yeah. stuff. In fact, Saddam, uh, a comment from Tony, which is very, very similar to this. Tony says, ensure your channels are joined up. So if a customer initiates the interaction online and continues later on the phone, the previous interaction is visible and understood by the uh, advisor. So, uh, so I'm uh, I, I, love, I, love, I love that comes to um, your kind of that voice of the customer, where you store those interactions, and then how you make that information available to your agents across any 
uh, channel, irrespective of how the customer gets in to provide that consistency. But to the previous point, um, even if a customer starts up in one channel, if you've got no voice agents or there's a sudden spike and you've got no voice agents to be able to deal with that, you can offer in real time the ability to speak to a chat agent. And if the, if the caller accepts that, then you can just SMS them a link and they can switch to chat. So, you know, just because a person starts up in one channel, you know, you need to have the ability to be quite flexible to uh, to shift uh, in, in real time. Yeah, I mean, somewhere in the system, you've got to have an integrated inbox with an integrated interaction history. Yeah. yeah. Um, talking about multiple channels, uh, Ashley said, give callback a choice as well as on hold choices. We all ha hate waiting on hold. Many IVRs were allowed the option to let the callers leave their phone number so they can receive a call back when someone is available. Since uh, reality is that everyone will have to wait on hold every now and again, configure the option for music or silence during their hold time. I think that's certainly a very, uh, uh, a very good, uh, a very good approach to uh, deal with. Because I guess um, in many ways, messaging is rather asynchronous. That you can send a message in, yeah. you can get a response back, um, which is uh, somewhat different from live chat. That you can have the two-way conversation but it can be somewhat time delayed. I guess email to some extent can be that. Well, we're reaching the uh, top of the hour. So I'd just like to ask today, what did you like best about today's webinar? We'll uh, have a look at, at the uh, winning tip and the winning tip comes in, I think uh, uh, from uh, Ashley Eleven, who's uh, put an awful lot of tips in today. Yes, and uh, Ashley <laughs> has put in quite a long tip here. So after listening to a bunch of menu options or prompts from a chat bot, uh, what I found is most people <laughs> want to have a human being on the receiving end of the phone. I'd recommend, uh, I'd also recommend no voicemail dead ends. What could be more frustrating to customers than go through a series of prompts just to end in someone's voicemail? If you make menu prompts intuitive, such as press one for assistance, followed by press two for sales, the prompts and call flows should uh, make sense to your clients or your customers. I think is a, a very good, uh, very good tip there. Um, so when we uh, finish the webinar, if you'd like to, um, uh, uh, being digital, use our post webinar survey. We review all the uh, uh, comments when they come through. If you'd like to uh, share a replay of this with your management team, it is quite a strategic topic. So uh, I can imagine your management team being quite interested in that. Uh, we're gonna be back on Thursday when looking at the, the key to better conversation with customers. So just like to say thank you to our two speakers. Thank you, Martin, for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you very much, everybody. Indeed. And uh, Sadam, thank you for joining us for our first webinar together. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. We're back on Thursday when we're looking at that, uh, improving conversations with customers. Thanks very much, and uh, see you all there. Bye-bye.